the Pinchcliffe Grand Prix is a Norwegian stop motion film from 1975. It's a children's movie and a bit of a national treasure. So most people who have seen this movie probably have a relatively strong emotional connection to it. I do not. We'll talk about some of the reasons why this movie is particularly endearing, why that, um, why it is a national treasure, why it may have caught on. Uh, certainly this movie has a lot of character. There's no doubt it's an inspiring movie for anyone with an active imagination. And I think it does embody a certain Scandinavian identity. It's easy to see why this became a classic. At the same time, it's a somewhat clunky movie, somewhat dated, with some missing pieces, some things that don't totally add up, some things that in, you know, might be a bit more streamlined in, in, a, in a modern sort of Pixar movie or something like that. But why am I reviewing this? Um, it's not because of anything I've mentioned already. It's actually because there's some really interesting subtext that sneak in under some of the main story lines. But let's start at the beginning. So first of all, I watched the English version of this film, um, and I'm going to be using the, the names from that. Um, to talk about the movie. In fact, the title of the movie is totally different in Norwegian. Um, I'm not able to pronounce it. I have one Norwegian friend, and I'd like to keep it that way. Well, I'd like to have at least one friend. Maybe I'd, I'd be open to more in the future, um, but uh, I won't try saying uh, the, the, the true name of the film. Um, I know some people aren't, aren't a huge fan of dubbing. Uh, it's not really noticeable here. I think the English version of this movie is fine, and stop-motion animation is probably one of the easier things to dub. Um, really, so this movie opens up with a cameraman, not a real cameraman, but with a little animated guy pointing a big camera at an easel. The narrator explains that the cameraman is going to make the opening credits. Interesting. So essentially, this stop motion film starts by showing a man making a stop motion film. This is the kind of thing that probably sets off all sorts of alarm bells in your head if you have any experience with academic film studies. There's a camera in a movie. Sound the alarm. What does it mean? Perhaps it's just playful self-reference. But maybe there's more to it. Positioning the film itself in the world of Pinchcliffe, likening it to some of the inventions and exploits that we will see. Maybe the idea is to position the film itself as some sort of technological folktale, uh, something that is inventive, modern, but also quaint and traditional. This is a theme we're going to see throughout the film a lot. Maybe it's something else, but interesting way to start the movie. The narrator introduces us to this world of pinch cliff, and particularly a bicycle mechanic named Theodore Rim Spoke. Rim Spoke, very clever. Um, he lives with a hedgehog and a magpie named Lambert and uh, Sonny Duckworth. Sonny is a, is a magpie, not a duck, but his name is Duckworth. Uh, Sonny is positioned as a child. Lambert is maybe a bit more like an uncle. I have my doubts about the biological feasibility of either one of these relationships. It's fairly common for kids' movies to present children as animals. I think this might be a good way for them to preserve the individual individuality of a child, right? Children are not miniature adults. They're not future grown-ups. They're something unique, something magical, talking animals. Rim Spoke is a bicycle mechanic, but really he's an inventor. Bicycle mechanic is an interesting profession. It's a trade. It's something you would, wouldn't be too surprised to find in a small town in a village. But it's also something more than that. It's technological. The Wright brothers were famously bicycle mechanics. You'll never find a story about them that doesn't mention this. Rimspoke lives at the very top of the mountain. The narrator points out that this is a somewhat inconvenient place for a bike shop. Uh, a bad place to drag a bike with a flat tire. Of course, even if your bike didn't have a flat tire, riding a bike to the top of a mountain isn't that much fun. Rimspoke doesn't seem particularly concerned about the lack of traffic. He is happy, content to lead a somewhat isolated life working on his quirky inventions. For instance, uh, he has the combined shaving and raspberry picking machine. <laughs> uh, Rimspoke also operates an automated assembly line that makes flagpoles. It's a bit like a Rube Goldberg machine. It seems like there's maybe some clear influence from this movie to some of the works of Aardman Animation. Aardman Animation was founded in 1972, by the way, but Wallace and Gromit didn't come around until 1989 when A Grand Day Out came out. Very similar understated senses of humor between uh, those, those films and this one, and, and with lots of gadgets all around. I like most of the jokes in this movie. I think they're pretty funny, and they have some depth. The narrator describes the town of Pinchcliffe um, uh, <laughs> highlighting humorous things throughout, including 
the steam-driven cheese factory. Again, an understated joke, but also another little detail where we have something traditional and quaint mixed in with something uh, industrial and economic. Steam-powered cheese factory. Like I said, there is something about this movie that really cues up the imagination. It's playful. It's inventive. It gives a really potent world. But I also think there's something really Scandinavian about the movie. This is just my guess. I obviously don't have an intuition for this. This bike shop at the top of a mountain, though, a bit detached, a bit traditional, idiosyncratic, um, at home with its ways. Okay, I was attempting to give a bit of a plot summary, and we didn't make it past the setting and a couple of the characters, so let's get back to what happens. This is a movie about car racing. Basically, there's a character named Rudolf Gore Slimy, who, unsurprisingly, is a bad guy. He worked for Rimspoke at one point, and it turns out he stole some of the designs for a race car. Sonny and Rimspoke uh, want to challenge Gore Slimy to a race, uh, want to build their own car. Rimspoke wants to build his own car that competes. Um with Gore Slimy, who's, who's achieving some international fame, who's on television and such. Uh, but Roomspoke doesn't have the funds. Conveniently, there happens to be a sheikh in Pinchcliffe for vacation. A sheikh? That's right. Abu, Abdul Ben Bonanza um, is some sort of Middle Eastern sheikh with immense wealth coming from oil. And here we have one of the first <laughs> uh, very interesting subtexts of the film. Norway has an interesting relationship with oil. Um, in the early 70s, when this film was made, the country would have just been on the verge of tapping into the oil in the North Sea. This is actually mentioned in the movie, but apparently, according to the film, the funds aren't available yet, hence the need for some sort of external funding. In 1972, also when this film was being made, took three and a half years to make this movie, by the way, uh, Norway decided by referendum that they did not want to join the European Union. Interesting. Clearly, the specter of the oil industry hangs over this movie. It's a bit hard to know if it's promoting any particular angle, but maybe the idea is to give some sort of blueprint of how you might bring together the industrial and the traditional. Um, and a homemade automobile, that's kind of the crux of it. It's an interesting thing, that a bit of an oxymoron, a homemade automobile, because cars are part of a huge network. Gasoline, roads, they're standardized. A car has to plug into this network and work with it. But on the other hand, this is a handcrafted car, one that is uh, full of local uh, character and quirks. For Norwegians in the 70s, the prospects of oil might have been confusing. Uh, this is perhaps an attempt to hash out some sort of coexistence uh, between an endearing national identity and also perhaps some sort of recluse thing, not in the EU, a bit farther away, a separate identity. Um, can we reconcile that? with participating in a global economy, a global economy that perhaps they don't know what to make of. Sheikh Bonanza, <laughs> Abdul Ben Bonanza, is an odd character, definitely not a local. This film does just about everything it can to portray him as an other, as kind of weird. Perhaps this is the uncertainty um, that some people are feeling at that time. But I'm really no Scandinavian historian, so I won't read into it <laughs> too deeply, but these, these things are pretty, pretty clearly there. Um, in the film. Like I said, a direct reference to the North Sea oil not yet being, the funds from it not yet being publicly available. Of course, these days, Norway has an enormous pension fund um, funded by oil. Um, sometimes uh, when people uh, talk about the benefits of some of the um, social welfare programs in Norway, they neglect to mention uh, this source of revenue for the government. But that's neither here nor there. Um, the Sheikh has two travel companions, a maiden who dances for him, and a gorilla, or possibly chimpanzee, that is his chauffeur slash bodyguard and who later plays the drums. Animal selection in films like this is always interesting. The gorilla here is a bit alarming. Norway in the 70s was not a very diverse place. And while I don't think this is a malicious film, it clearly leans into some stereotypes you wouldn't really see today, ideas of minstrelsy and exoticism. Uh finds it very easy to adopt some of these stereotypes, doing so as an attempt at understated humor. It's another kind of quirky joke, I think. Uh, the Dancing Maiden is also <laughs> a bit odd. She seems to be another magpie, and there's a brief romantic interlude between her and Sonny, which is a bit bizarre. Uh, the Sheikh is human, but the woman who serves him is not. It's always interesting to think about why different characters end up as different animals. 
right? There's a couple of humans in this movie and a lot of animals. How do they pick which ones? They don't pull uh, from a hat. These characters are supposed to be compelling or funny or relatable. They're optimized for something, and, and sometimes that's pretty telling. Um, eventually, the Sheikh sees Rimspoke's plans for his car, um, a car that can take down Gore Slimy, and instantly the Sheikh realizes that it's brilliant. The moment he sees them, he just sees a scrap of paper with a plan scribbled on them, and immediately he decides to fund this genius Rim spoke. Here we have another idea that's pretty common in children's movies, the transcendent merit, transcendental merit of a good idea, right? This is the thought that there are ideas that are just so great, they are immediately recognized by people of substance. All you need is to see them on a piece of paper, and you'll immediately want to give all your money to the person who scribbled them down. Um, if you have one of these ideas, it will carry you wherever you need to go. There are a lot of children's stories about inventors, and they all work kind of on this basis. But is this how things work in the real world? Well, I don't think so. Now, I happen to work in one of the largest corporate research labs in the world. I think it might be the largest, actually. I work for the company that uh, typically publishes the most patents every year uh, out of any American company. Um, and hypothetically, my workplace should be full of inventors, people having eureka moments coming up with these transcendental ideas. Um, but I can tell you that's absolutely not what innovation today looks like. Uh, for one thing, people work on teams. Uh, it's not individuals. Um, and innovation, it's very gradual. It's taking a, a complex idea, tweaking some piece of it, or taking two complex ideas, joining them together. And it's possible that, that now things are just so complicated that that's inevitably the way it works. But I think it goes deeper than that. And in fact, in working in research, I've, to some degree, stopped believing in good ideas existing at all. Now, there are certainly some bad ideas, but really, most of the ideas that catch on, the main thing that I would use to describe them is that they're popular. Often, you know, they're not, I would say they're not bad ideas, but usually they have all kinds of trade-offs. Uh, there's technologies that rise and fall. There's things that come to the forefront and that later people realize are not so good. And in fact, even the car, right, even the gas-powered car in this movie, which seems like maybe some transcendental genius idea, although obviously it wasn't developed by one person and it wasn't uh, feasible until there were huge social economic context, extremely complicated the rise of the car. Um, certainly the car was not an invention, but anyway, the, even the car, which we once would have taken for granted as a great idea, now we're seeing the electric car coming along and we're realizing, oh, there's all kinds of trade-offs, right? Are there good ideas or are there just popular ideas, things that catch on and things that people sort of accept the trade-offs and get used to the trade-offs of? Well, I think it's more of the second one. Anyway, obviously, <laughs> I could talk about this for a long time, but that's not the point. This idea of the transcendental merit of a good idea dovetails nicely with some myths of American capitalism and the American dream, the idea that hard work and a great idea will take you anywhere. This conveniently sidesteps critical thinking about circumstance. It sidesteps any uncontrollable circumstances or undeserved situation. It sidesteps uh, thinking about privilege. It's naive, essentially, but it's popular to tell kids about inventors. And maybe it inspires them. I'm not, I'm not sure it's a bad thing. Uh, but the thing that I think is interesting is how this probably also impacts our historical views of invention. Like I said, it's possible that things are just more complicated now, uh, that we're no longer in the age of individual discovery, but perhaps we once were. But really, I suspect that longer ago, in the past, um, things were probably very similar to how they are now. But we're so used to telling stories about invention uh, that we've written inventors into our history where businessmen, teams of people, slow progress, and a lot of less glamorous things uh, were the reality. We've kind of come up with inventors as our own stories. Um, what does invention even mean? How is it different from simply making something? A lot of kids who want to be inventors, uh, but you rarely hear adults talk about it. Anyway, this movie isn't American, but it still buys into this to some extent, this idea of invention. Like I said, very common in children's movies, a, a really fascinating idea how we've sort of created this idea of invention, how we've invented invention. Um, interestingly, this movie kind of buys into invention, but it also is satirizing it. Rimspoke's inventions are mostly ridiculous. I talked about the shaving uh, raspberry picking machine. Um, when he talks about the car, all the features of the car are made up, similarly to Wallace and Gromit, in fact. Uh, this, this movie 
it's satirizing the idea of invention. At the same time, it's kind of propagating it. It's not uncommon for movies to have this kind of ambivalent position about something that's complicated. And ultimately, I think there's a manifestation of all the things I just said, all the uncertainty about whether or not invention is a real thing. The myth of invention is carried forward in this movie in a surprisingly subtle way. Uh, I want to finish by talking a little bit about television. Television is somewhat omnipresent in this film. Uh, the tiny town of Pinchcliffe has its own television station. Rimspoke learns of Gore Slimy's car uh, and the race via television. The Grand Prix itself is televised. Uh, we, have, we see all these people of Pinchcliffe watching at home, these cutaway shots um, to them on their couches cheering along and such. By the way, when Rimspoke shows up at the race, he brings a car um, called Il Tempo Gigante. Italian name, interesting. There's, we could get into that, but um, the car looks a bit like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, something quite old-fashioned. All the other cars at the race are contemporary. They're 70s racing machines. Um, if I knew more about Speed Racer, by the way, I might want to try and work that into this um, review as well, but I, I, I've seen minutes of that show only. Um, anyway, this television stuff, well, the car, right, right, um, uh, is another telling example of sort of bringing together the sacred national identity, the, the regional culture, um, on a world stage. And television, exact same thing, right? Um, regional uh, uh, identity and global economy. And when we take a step back, we can see that really the film itself falls into the exact same mold. The film itself brings together regionalism. It has all this character, but also it's, you know, a mainstream international film that has uh, gone far beyond Norway, um, that's popular all over the place, and that is made uh, to go far beyond Norway, that was intended to plug into a much larger system of film grammar and uh, narrative ideas that are not just um, uh, from Scandinavia, but are global. So that's the Pinchcliffe Grand Prix. Even if you're not a kid, I think you might like this movie. Like I said, it has a lot of character. It's fairly amusing, relatively funny. It's quirky, and it has some interesting subtexts. What more could you want?